I just, yeah. So he said, come back and he didn't even hesitate to say. Yeah. He's yeah. like, oh, we got to get this out. <laughs> so we'll see. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it, I'm anticipating it will help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, welcome to class. I got a couple of you here. I know you all will be straggling on. So I'll be uh, jumping on to do the second part of the webinar at noon. Um, and so uh, if you guys haven't registered, it is like a registration type of thing. Otherwise, you got to wait till probably tomorrow until it's live on YouTube. So interesting little story. I did 56 and a half minutes of, of Second Sunday broadcasted. I saw myself. It said streaming. It said record. No muted. I checked all the bells and whistles. No, no dice. So we're looking into it for our, our, um, our, you know, Vimeo. We're, we're like looking at IT about it. And it was just an interesting, weird thing because it's going to be perfect for this class. So what I thought I would do is I would do second Sunday today right now for, for you guys, because I was like, damn it, that was good. And you know, when you're channeling, you're like, I can't re-say that. I can't re-say that. So, but the cool thing is, is like with time and space, like even like I was, I, I do this a lot. I take my own classes. Okay. So I'll be, I'll be channeling, but I'm literally going, oh yeah, that's good. I need that. You know, like in the back of my own mind, I've got it like a classroom in there. And, and when I got finished, it was like, yeah, that's great. I'm going to go watch that again later, you know, for myself. And then it, it was nothing. And I was kind of like, ah. you know, it, it's one of those echo moments where, where, right. So, so four echoes, you lose something, something breaks, right. You get attacked or judged. That one's very comfortable at this point. Um, or you get sick. Okay. And, and, and so it was like, okay, we lost something. All right, great. That means I'm leveling up. And I am because this, this like, you know, it's an interesting space because I want you guys to be aware of your seasonal PTSD, okay? It's it's real. So it's usually around your birth month or around some holidays, or it could be summer, or it could be like, I noticed like when I really fine tune my pattern over these years, summer was always a really um, high level of survival time for me because I was at home as a child, you know, you're, you're not in school. And it's like the, the security of going to school for six to seven hours a day when your home life is not safe, all of a sudden being at home with no money and, and, you know, no options and you're literally terrified. So I would always before quantum fitness put on 20 pounds every summer, which sucked because bathing suit season. Right. And I would always be like, you know, I'm not even hungry in the summer, but it would be like that survival package would show up. And and then, you know, around the holidays, it was like, I always figured out how to make a lot more money because I love gift giving, right? And if you remember in quantum fitness part one, the love language of the ego is excessive gifting, right? And so I, it was like, I, I, could, I could get my abundance up during the holiday season, no problem. But it was always like gluttonous gift giving and like shame and guilt, like, sorry, I couldn't show up all year for you, you know, it, and so it's just like, sometimes your PTSD isn't always about shrinkage. Sometimes it's, you'll have extreme growth. So if you really start to pay attention to your vibration, like this whole summer has not been way and waiting, but it's been growth. So like when you actually replace a pattern with like a pattern is kind of like a full circle reality that you don't know you're repeating. Okay. But when you're no longer repeating that cycle, you're building a new cycle, okay? And it doesn't feel like 10 steps forward, 10 steps back. And I'm going to break it down exactly how growth feels. And I think, I don't, I remember it was Barbara, somewhere we were talking about this just the other day. And it was like, it doesn't feel like 10 steps forward, 10 steps back. It feels like a, a toddler trying to tie your shoes and you've got to get, catch the bus. like. You, you know your brain knows how to do this. You know that you can do this, but it's like the calculations, like the body is not, it's not harmonious yet. This new pattern is not fluid. Like this new you is not effortless like the pattern was. The pattern is just like you get caught up in a pattern and it's, you know, so intoxicating, good and bad that you don't notice it for three months. 
you see? So, but when you're in a growth cycle, it feels continuously like a toddler trying to do basic life skills. And it is frustrating and it seems like things are not working. And what I realized as like months and months and months of this was passing because it was like things were working and going smoothly. Like when I would take stock, I'd be like, everything's fine. But then it would be like these, these ultra frustrating experiences and they were all new to me. So someone who had to decompartmentalize and heal their pride, right? Which is a major part of spiritual ego, right? Difference between being proud of yourself and pride. Pride is a wall of perfectionism and knowledge and wisdom. And, you know, I'm better than you. That is underneath the surface from, you know, whatever you've paid for, studied for, or, or believe about yourself. And pride is a major wall that, you know, you, you cannot get past your abundance level of pride. Okay. So one of the things that higher self will do once you get out of a pattern and you are new is you have to literally like be proud of basic skills again, because think about it, like a caterpillar knows how to be a caterpillar, but a butterfly does not know how to use their wings yet. All right. We don't know how to think in certain present moment situations. We're not pulling from the past anymore. We're showing up different. And it's not really even calculating that we're showing up different until after the fact. And we're not making those same repetitive choices into suffering. So the, then it's like this new choice, but you have no certainty. There's no net. There's no like, you know, and, but there's also, once you biohack, there's so much less fear. So it's like, you're not afraid of quantum leaping. You're not afraid of it. And without the pride, you're also not afraid, Dremel, to be a rookie, to be a beginner. This is not starting over. This is not, this is not starting over at the beginning of the book. This is starting the second book in your novel, right? So yes, it is the beginning. And we don't know where this character is going because this whole last book shaped and developed this character. Now, the character that has become is now online as a vibrational being, literally in that, oh, like I said, every time you guys go through a biohacking, a three-day experience, you start in your beginning of your seventh year cycle in self-awareness. And we are so programmed that we know certain things that sometimes like basic things like require your awareness again, because you've been doing a lot of things automatically that when you become present and you don't have a lot of those patterns running in the back of your program, you're going, wait, hold on a second. Let me pay attention to this. Like, how does the freaking washing machine work? Because you've been doing it for years with, you know, thinking about the, something else. And, and that association is not there anymore. That it's like one, I think the reason why it feels like a toddler trying to tie shoes when they know they know how to tie their shoes, but when you're in a hurry, right? And the bus is going to leave. It's like you have that little bit of a freeze feeling and that's what being new feels like. So it's, it's like a new kind of challenge, right? Growth is a completely different diving board. It's like once you start asking for change <laughs> and then you call your own bluff and take it, that's when I'm, now I'm seeing, like I'm having the sessions with people and we're going to do this Zoom call. We're going to do this Zoom call. I'm going to have Barbara there. Anybody that's gone through the biohacking week at my house is going to be on this Zoom call because it's hilarious. Like it's hilarious, like the stories that, you know, the, the beginning, the middle and, and the, the beginning of the end, you know, it's like as they've gone home being this new version of themselves, it's like I'm getting the tantrum calls, which I love. I love them so much because it's not like, you're still with that toxic dude, like 10 years later. No, it's like, I'm frustrated that I can't do it. And I'm like, yes. And I'm scared because now I have what I want and I don't know what to do. You know, like I'm loving these calls so much because it's different. Remember quantum healing, notice what's different. And when you are more of yourself, we have to give ourselves permission. So like I've had to check myself 
several times this last few months and be like, Jess, you're only in self-awareness. You're not in self-mastery anymore of that pattern. You have to go back to self-aware. You have to notice you. You have to, oh, all right, this is me. You know what I mean? Like I'm having to kind of go back. So the coolest thing about where we are in the ascension right now is that we don't need a death experience to lock in the you know, experience into the collective Akash and start over. You know, before when the world was very dark and we didn't have it gridded out and the light workers weren't here and we haven't put so much love back in and Mother Earth hasn't expanded, we would come here with like very slim pickings of the identification of love. Most everything was torture and abuse here. We would come here and we would have one moment of love. We would have you know, one sunset that we would hold on to for eternity. We'd have one kiss that we would hold on for a hundred thousand years. You've probably dated that person by now. You know what I mean? And, and we would die and then we would be so excited to come back for that one feeling. Well, this time when we get to come back, we, we have, a, a, we have opened so much of our DNA and we've activated so much of our Kundalini from all of this awareness work. See, none of it's, none of it's been, uh, you know, purposeless, all of this work, all the money you paid to be enlightened has been for a reason, trust me. It is because you now can create your new reality in your old reality without the physical death experience. You do still have the death experience guaranteed. Every time you break up with someone, every time you lose someone, every time you know, you're know you frozen in time, every time a PTSD is frozen, every time there's a Christina sitting in the grass waiting for you to come back and pick her up after 45 years of abandoning her, you know, that is your death experience. And so um, we've been including this magnetic acupuncture into our seven circuit program. And I'm gonna tell you, Andy, she came to me. She's a new student. She went through the quantum fitness program. She's gone through the alchemy. She came to the house. She did a, her week and her, her butterfly effect. Basically when she got home, she invented this. And I'm, when I tell you that it is so profoundly genius, like, I don't even want to share too much because she's trademarking it right now. That's how good it is. It's, it's, so futuristic. Think about acupuncture, right? We're opening the chi, we're opening the meridians, we're getting the body to cross communicate and cross pollinate again. And it's bringing the body back into life. But with magnets, oh Lord, what we can do with magnets in acupressure points in strategic places, we can separate trauma from the blood. We can separate the soul from the body without a death experience. We can resurrect a, the death experience that's been in the back of your programming. Literally within like 22 minutes, I think we are capping out is like, that's when it starts to feel more like neutral. We're, we're doing clinical research right now because it's fundamentally so perfect for biohacking. Now on its own, it's kind of like the miracle technology. It can be scary on its own, left unattended. It needs to be part of a family, this acupuncture, I truly believe. Now, now Annie will be able to use it because she's got so much other training for multiple different rates. But what the way that I'm using it in quantum fitness as part of our beta alpha experience is to fully get rid of all of those lingering death experiences that are causing loss and grief and suffering and fear and guilt and shame and humiliation and resentment. Those are the culprits. Okay, those parts of your pain body, we're renaming pain body because we don't want to steal Eckhart Tolle's name, even though it's perfect, we're going to call it the trauma body. It's the trauma body and it's got a personality and it ain't, it, it's not doing you any good. It's all it's doing is feeding its own need that it, then it can prove itself. See, I'm not seen, I'm not heard, I'm not loved, I'm not safe, I got nothing. That big thick wall we've created has also keeping freedom and abundance out, right? We put this wall to protect ourselves, but it's also, it's, it's a catch 22 because you're protecting yourself from the universe as well of bringing you everything that you are. So, and all you are is abundance. So if you're not getting abundantly free, you're getting abundantly not free, you see, because you are abundance. And so because you are freedom, 
if you are lacking freedom, then you are abundantly unfree. See? And the more you practice this, the more resistance you build, the more evidence you get, the more you prove it. And now your pain personality is righteous and it has pride about its own suffering, you see? And it can go, it can live, it's, you can live a whole life like this. And we're really gonna talk about this in the second part of the webinar today. And it's all gonna be about Kundalini energy and the root chakra. So pay, pay if you can join in at noon. Otherwise it'll be on YouTube in the next couple of days. So what I didn't get to say in Second Sunday, where I did say, but I get to re-say, Joy, is that I was talking about this secret of balance, all right? That most people who are going through a healing experience, when they first start on the bridge, they're extremists. You remember, right? You remember your extremist phase of awakening where you couldn't get enough right? You were binging, watching, reading, taking, studying, you know, meditating. You were blissed out and completely, you know, in the fetal position. You were so high and so low, right? And I would say that that's pretty normal because we're coming from a place of resistance and resistance and resistance, and I'm not allowed to be me, and I'm not allowed to be me, and I'm not allowed to be. And spirituality gives you permission to be okay as the weirdo. Spirituality gives you permission to find other aspects of yourself, all right? So then we we notice that we hit this wall with spirituality because there's a still judgment. It's like, well, what if I'm not all light and love? Do I still get to come to the kingdom of heaven? And they're like, no, you cannot. And you're like, wait, what? But, but, you know, and so then you go, well, screw spirituality. Let's go study alchemy, right? And so here we are studying alchemy. And that is the science of you, the dark and the light, and the gold that is made from merging the pressure points. So when we look at your darkest, darkest, darkest points, really, really, your probably intimate family knows them, and your lightest, 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 lightest points that maybe nobody's even gotten to experience yet because there's not a platform for you yet, okay? In that, in that extreme of you, remember, it's like in this reality, the darkest parts of you and the lightest parts of you have integrated or at least are trying to integrate. This is it, the final phase of ascension where Okay, we've gotten the knowledge, the wisdom, we've served karma, purgatory, whatever you want to call it. We've been in hell as these germinating seeds, and now it's time to bloom. But see, what's inside of the seed is half dark and half light. Now, when we look at darkness, we could rename it as density. Okay, so when you look at a seed, there is material, but there is also energy. And there is also water, which is the conduit. So remember, ice, water, steam. This idea of the three aspects of you, me, myself, and I. The density is the me, okay? The myself is the bridge, the body, the inner child, okay? That the me is the pain body, the trauma body, is the, the part of you that's like, no fear, I'm heavy. This takes time. Are we there yet? That's the pain body, all right? The body itself is like, go, 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 go. I want to go, I want to live. And then the walls are there. Okay, that's where the inner child is like, no fear, I can't have my adventure and can't go where I want, all right? Then the higher self is the energy, is the energy that creates all the life. So when you are stuck in your seed and it is your time to grow, it is gonna feel like something inside of you is going 150 miles an hour, but your brakes are on. And it's not gonna feel like your brakes, it's gonna feel like outside brakes, Money breaks, time breaks, people breaks, body breaks. It's not going to feel like you're creating that environment. It isn't at all, but it is, all right? So the sweet, the sweet sauce here is the secret to alchemy. All this year, we've been studying alchemy, which is all of me. It is the aspects of me. It is the... It is the personality identifications that I had to develop from trauma. It is the parts of my light that I've never gotten to show. It is the parts of me that is the past, past, past lineage, bloodline. It is the descendants. It's the ancestors. It's the past, present, future realities of me. It's my potential. Okay. That's alchemy. 
And all of those aspects have different personalities, right? And some of you can identify nine, right, on a good day. And some of you that have been very trapped have even more. Some are very dangerous and some are very, very kind and loving. And this is just you, right? And when we merge and intersect the darkest point of you and the lightest point of you, what we get is gold, okay? We get, we get something that's very heavy and dense, but something that is, it's priceless. It's a diamond after the coal has been, you know, pressurized out. This is the metaphor of the human experience moving back into the light body, which we don't want to do yet. We want to be unique. We want to be here. We want to live heaven on earth, taste, touch, feel, experience before we turn back into light. This is why we came. We want to experience all of that before we go back and go, okay, now we're all light here. So there's no contrast. So we are wanting to enjoy that superhuman potential in the contrast, which is the density. So trying to remove density or trying to eliminate this part of yourself has never worked, you know, because that is saying something is bad about you. Something is broken about you. It's never been broken. It's just been separated, right? I've got lots of videos showing this in the chakras. This is how you get separated from yourself. Welcome to your first seven years of childhood, where you get to learn that you're not allowed to be intuitive. You get to learn that only your intuition is good if it helps other people. You get to learn that you don't have a voice and that you're not allowed to be free. And then hopefully in your 30s or 40s, 50s or 60s, you figure out, hold on a second, maybe I can be free. And then you go on this journey. Okay. And so you're probably somewhere between the middle of the bridge and the end of the bridge right now, if you're watching me. All right. This is not a kindergartner experience, even though we use this language. This is like the end of the bridge. Like I'm, I'm done, but you no longer kind of want to die anymore because you're like, I'm going to see how this ends. You're no longer really feeling homesick anymore because you've got yourself. You're no longer like needing to like go on some, you know, spiritual experience with your, Peru or some sort of shaman because you are the shaman. So all of those things are taken care of at this point, right? Am I right? Okay, you you got this. But the butterfly wings, the angel wings, you know, the de demon wings, whichever wings you're preferring at this point, you don't know how to fly them, okay? And you're sitting in this nest going, I know I got these things, but I what if I get out there and they don't work? What if I get out there and I, my body doesn't know how to use this? What if my set doesn't work, right? What if I've got the faulty wings? You know, what if I, I fall to my death? But you're like, well, I'm not really scared of death. That would actually be cool at this point. So you're not really scared of death anymore. So then, but you're kind of like what I was saying in the last class, I think it was Lionsgate, is your true shackles are love. Who are you going to leave behind? Who's in your nest who don't have wings, Right. Who it doesn't believe you have wings and you can't see anyone else with wings out there. You're going to be the only one. That's going to be weird. You're just going to be flying around. What are you going to do? What does a butterfly eat that a caterpillar doesn't, right? We don't even know. And what is love to a butterfly that is in a state of constant unattachment versus what is love to a caterpillar that literally they need to huddle together to keep warm and safe? You see? So it's just like, well, who am I? And this is what we want to see. This is what you came for. None of us know. We're literally all in this new journey together. We're figuring it out. It's like grown-up toddlers, hopefully with a little bit of cash or at least credit, right? No parent telling us what to do. We got stupid government saying you can't do that, but we we figured that out. You know, we got all kinds of tricks to be outlaws and renegades, and we've been manipulating cookies out of the closet since we were five. We've got this, okay? But what the secret sauce here is that a lot of us forget. Because our soul has been going 180 miles an hour inside of our bodies since the day we were born. And our bodies just keep putting on the brakes. The world keeps putting on the brakes. The money keeps saying, nope, you can go this far, but there's not this far. You could buy this, but not that. You can have this person, but not that person. And so we are so used to settling that we are now loaded with our abundance of what we've settled for. Look around at your house right now. Look around at your life right now. 
you probably have a lot when you compare yourself with like, you know, a basic needs type of tribe that's like basic needs only. Okay. You probably got more than one TV. Okay. You probably got a refrigerator full of food you don't want to eat. You got clothes they don't want to wear. You got, you know, memories you don't want to have. You got people in your life you wish weren't there. Right. And you got people in your life you wish were there that aren't there. You got clothes that are out there that you wish you had. You see, so we call this the, the caterfly is the the lack filled abundance. That is the final stage of caterpillar, where you have given your inner child everything, right? You have sowed your oats. You but it's all been settled. You have not taken the trip you wanted. You took the trip you could afford. Okay. And if you did take the trip you could afford, then you probably ate ramen noodles when you got home. You see, so it's like, and again, and maybe you went on credit and charge it, and then you had to come home and pay that off next year. That don't feel good. Because in the third dimensional reality, as the caterpillar, you have to give up something in order to get something. And it has to be something you love, like your time or your freedom or, you know, somebody else. Okay. So in the third dimension, there's all these rules and we've never bought into them, except we have unconsciously because we've had to go along with this. This is why I gave you guys in that Lionsgate, that analogy of the jail walls going away. Like, who would you be? Would you be the one that sits around and waits and see if anybody gets headshot? Or are you crawling out military style with leaves pasted on you? Or are you running for the border? Or are you like just waiting for your buddy to pick you up because you've been planning this your whole life? Okay, you're gonna fall into those four categories. And that will also tell you where you are on your bridge. All right, if you got people you're meeting, you're at the end of this bridge, okay? If you're if you're crawling out because you're scared, you're in the middle of the bridge, all right? If you're running like hell, you're at the beginning of the bridge, right? And if the other one, you haven't even just taken a step off. So you wanna look at where you are and then where you are, no judgment, I am where I am. Your only work here, is to find balance. How you can reach the state of alchemy is not from going from one extreme to the other. We need to do that at first because you're starving. Starving needs to be gluttonized. We know this. When you're a starving kid, when you're starving for love, starving for attention, starving for stuff, starving for success, starving for education, starving for knowledge, starving for appreciation, affection, what, fill in the blank. We all come starving right and that's going to be a very key key explanation that i explained to you what happens in your physical body when your emotions are starving when your emotions are starved it alters your physical body okay now depending on what you were deprived of or unnurtured of or over nurtured of as a child you are starving for so if a child was over nurtured they're starving i want to do it myself i want to do it myself OK, I want to make my own money. I want to make my own time. I want to make my own. I want to do it myself. OK, if they're under nurtured, they're like, would someone please help me? <laughs> please, anybody. Nobody here. Nobody can hear me. You're going to fall into those two categories. Bottom line, you're going to be starving for help or you're going to be starving to do this for yourself. OK, it don't matter. Yang and yang. It is what it is. So for you guys, you want to identify with where you were starving. Where are you starving time, relationships, health, money? And where you're starving, you're going to find the most gluttony. All right? Your gluttony is going to be found in over-processing and getting of settled energy. It's like, I can't have the dream house I want, so let me fill my apartment full of crap that is going to weight me down. And then what happens is it creates more of the caterpillar effect because now you're house poor or car poor or, you know, time poor, okay? Because gluttony goes all through you, just like adrenaline goes all through your sugars and leaves you fatigued. What you do when you're starving is you overfeed. This explains the narcissist and empath relationship, okay? Two starving beings, one victim, one perpetrator, okay? Same wounds. We're both we're both, my, the narcissist, the empath, we're both empaths, but we're both wounded. One is either over-nurtured or 
overfed somewhere early and one was underfed early. So when I'm starving, I know that you're hungry. And so I want to feed you. Okay. If I was force fed religion, force fed attention, inappropriate relationships, force fed, then I am going to reject your love. That's a narcissist. Okay. So you're going to meet several narcissists to your empath on your road. Business partners, coworkers, parents, loved ones, spouses, children. All right. It's going to happen. And it's going to be in your intimate, probably circle of five, which is someone who tells you what to do, someone who tells you who you get to be, someone gets to tell you who you're allowed to have, or at least you have to co-create with. Someone you're co-creating with has probably been or has been your one of your narcissists. Why? Why are the why is this narcissist and empath relationship so important for you completing your bridge? I hope that you really take this to heart because it's really about what the second Sunday was about. Because what happens is they're both coming from starving and overfed, and they're both in punishment. Either I must be punished or you must be punished. It's an, a wound that creates a personality identification. Now, the interesting thing about narcissism is a narcissist is not a narcissist to everyone. It's just to you. And now you have probably been called a narcissist at some point by someone. And you were like, me? Perfect me? Yep, probably. Now, the interesting thing about that is doesn't mean you are a narcissist. But to someone else who is processing the wounds and filters from their belief system, you're falling into that category. Definition of an empath is someone who is empathetic. Now, a wounded empath is someone who's empathetic to everyone except themselves. And a narcissist is an empath. A wounded, wounded um, empath is a narcissist who is only empathetic to themselves. Everything they do is about them because they were told or overfed or overloved or overgiven as a child. And therefore, the world is theirs. This is why narcissists are usually quite abundant. Okay. They're really great at attracting money and help and support and love. They, they're, they're really good at. And you're always like, man, I am an empath and I can't rub two nickels together. And you're a narcissist and you've got $100,000 sitting in your you know, checking account right now. And you're going, this is not fair. Why is this an important relationship for you? Now, if you haven't had a physical narcissist in your reality, guess what? Drum roll. You are your own narcissist. To your own empath. There is a dual war going on in there. And this is what you're going to find with very reclusive people, people who are not in long-term relationships, people who have basically decided not to be around other people. They formulate that relationship inside as a way to awaken the wounded being. All right. Why is this relationship important? Because the narcissist needs a little bit of what the empath has, and the empath needs a little bit of what the narcissist has to be balanced. So even though they go to war, they are learning from each other's vibrations. They are taking it in. They are absorbing it. They are, are learning. Think about it. When you left that narcissist relationship, you were like, I got me some self-love, didn't you? You had to choose you if you were going to survive. Everything was lost for you. No one was left for you when that relationship ended. You probably lost money, you in integrity, you were humiliated, you were disrespected, you were abandoned, you were rejected, you were used. And all that was left was me, myself, and I. That's it. That's the purpose of that relationship for you, wounded empath. Now, the purpose of the, that this relationship for the narcissist, the narcissist, is to play out the pain to hopefully, it takes them longer, right? Because they're pushing energy and, and the empath is pulling energy. 
Okay, the narcissist, even if it's a feminine, is a very masculine identity. Okay, because it's very dominant. It's I'm the boss of you, no matter what. It's very manipulative. It's not a man thing. It's a masculine. Def it's a it's a dense, it's a dense characteristic. Okay, and the empath is very light and ethereal. It's very giving. It's very flowing. It's very life source. And the narcissist is very rigid and solid and mysterious and wondrous and passionate. Okay. So with this relationship, we can finish our journey. All right. You've got to find balance with a couple of things here. Where are you, your own narcissist, your own empath? Where are you super, super self-absorbed and don't care about anyone? And where do you not care about yourself at all? And care about everyone else all right because you got some different personalities now hopefully if you're if you're at the end of this bridge you're neutralizing these you're not so extreme noticing how you're not really starving right now right and you're not also accumulating a bunch of stuff from lack right you're just kind of finding more balance you're throwing things away you're letting go you're creating more unattachment you're creating more connections there's a little bit more flow to your life but the reason why there's not the full-blown quantum leap for you to step off the bridge into wonder wonderland of where everybody has wings and everybody's cool and nobody's like carrying a chip on their shoulder, right, is this balance within you, all right? That's it. It's balancing, right? So it's like the, the last step of enlightenment is to then balance your entire life. Because you've been seeking balance by this. Okay, you're too low. So now you've got to go too high to get the low up. Okay, you guys have noticed this. When you go really high, what happens the next day? Boom. Because the high is so high that in order for you to get back into a neutral zone, you've got to go to the opposite extremes. This is why the seven deadly sins, when you awaken, you usually go into the starvation of the seven deadly sins. No sex, no bad foods, no nothing. You're like a saint. And then, but then you're still in deprivation. Okay, you're still in deprivation. This is why I teach the methadone effect with addictions. Replace it with something good, but do not take something away. Do not take your children's toys away unless you're going to replace it with something healthier and better. Because the empty space identifies with the first seven years as I am bad. I have failed. I have lost you. I have lost me. When I take something, when I'm starving and you take my last food away, what am I going to do? I'm going to bite you, right? So if I'm going to take a cookie out of my hand, I better give myself something that is just as exciting and wonderful and delicious. And this is why when your life is thriving, you guys forget to eat. This is like when you're in that creative flow, you're not focusing on cookies or going out to dinner or, you know, buying a new shirt. You're focused on living, right? But notice when you get into lack, what you start craving. Lack, there's a better word for lack that I want to start using in quantum fitness, and that's called where are you starving? Because lack doesn't really compute with us the way we live. We're quite abundant. Even if you aren't making six figures, you know, even if your retirement isn't stacked, even if you don't have your 401k anymore because you used it to get your shamanism, right? It's like it, it, you have still so much abundance that when someone says you're in lack, it doesn't really register, does it? Because you're like, well, I'm not really lacking. I mean, I'm just not liking the choices, you know? <laughs> just, so, but when you say starving, that is a very important trigger word that you can include in your um, self-hypnosis. Where am I starving with time? Then what, so what, what happens when you reach starvation? What part of the brain is going to be navigating you hmm? when you're starving? Is it your frontal lobe, the genius creator? Absolutely not. It's going to be a good old reptilian brain that's going to try to figure out how to steal some food. Or charge up a credit card real quick, or go get a loan, or beg, borrow, steal. All right, you're going to move into desperation brain, and you're going to create a bigger problem by feeding yourself. I know I did this. I did this. I bought the biggest house I could afford. I filled every closet in the house. You've seen them. 
you guys know what I have. And then I tried to move that and almost wanted to die because I realized I was a hoarder. Seven trucks later, right? And now I'm on the flip side of that going, okay, like that was a wound in disguise of enlightenment, right? That was my spiritual ego going, you know, YOLO and inner child needs this and let's do this. And now I'm going, I don't need any of this, but I still like it, you know? And if, if you come to my house, you usually leave with an extra bag full of crap, especially if you're the same size as me, okay? So it's like this balance is the sweet space. So if you look at where you are right now, at this narcissist empath relationship, this person, place, or thing you're obsessed with, you're probably moving out of obsession if you're at the end of the bridge. Obsession is more of like drive and purpose obsession. It's not like I got to get a hit off this crack pipe name so-and-so, or I got to you know figure out how I'm going to make $10,000 tomorrow. You're probably at the end of the bridge you're more going, okay, so, all right, this is cool. Like, you know, but you're not starving. That's how you can decipher your trauma body size. And where you're starving will tell you where the wound is. Time, relationships, health, or mind. Right? What's starved the most in your reality? What keeps you from feeding on your own adventures? Like, you know, satisfying. The root word of love balanced is I am satisfied. I am content. That is your secret space of manifestation. If you want to manifest something fast, get satisfied with having it in here first. Okay. You cannot manifest something from lack. What you do is you lack some, you, you manifest something that looks like the food source you're craving but it's actually lack in disguise. When you attract a person, when you're starving, they are starving too. Ugh. You don't think you're starving. You're like, I'm ready to date again. I'm ready to put myself out there. I could take it or leave it. Bullshit, you starving. You about to get somebody who's starving and you're going to see in three months they're starving. And then you're going to be like, ew, you're starving. You know, you're thirsty, like, and it's going to get weird, but you don't realize that your spiritual ego is not letting you know you're starving because you have spiritually bypassed, spiritually bypassed and been like, everything's happening for a reason and blah, 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 blah. But when you look at your root trauma needs, that's where your work is right now to balance those. Okay. Where am I starving with time? Okay. When you don't have time, but you have money, you've ever felt that? Don't feel good, mm -hmm. right? When you have time and no money, that sure doesn't feel good. Notice in 3D, you always have to lose something. So you're never gonna have all of them at the same time in 3D, by the way, because the game is not set up for you to have that, at least not long-term. You might have that for five golden minutes and then mm -hmm. flatline, Okay, disappears. I mean, I guarantee in your timeline, you have met your soulmate and they died five minutes later. Guaranteed, somewhere. Okay. And in that, in reality, you have buried your treasure and then died. You're probably trying to figure out where you put it right now. Where I know I have this money, right? Well, notice where you want a vacation. Maybe you should start digging. Okay. It's there. You put it there. You could come back a thousand times. I'm sure you were a pirate at one point, okay? So all of our abundance is still here, by the way. And our higher self and ourselves that are parallel are always trying to get us to go. But if you're starving, all you're trying to do is feed. You're never trying to go find your purpose. You're never trying to really find your people. You're trying to fill a void, fill a hungry tummy, fill the emptiness. and so. The narcissist is going, where do I put all of this pain? <laughs> and this empath is like, I'll take it. I'm empty. Okay. And then they fill you up with pain. All right. And then they don't feel any better because it's their pain. So it comes right back. And then they're like, you didn't take my pain. You don't love me. I got so-and-so on the side because you're not good enough. 
right? That's the narcissist for you. And then you're the one who took all the pain is now completely empty except for pain. So it's a learning experience. With If you're playing one side or the other, you have to take it and milk it, which means, okay, I'm playing the narcissist here. You couldn't love me, right? Or I'm playing the empath here. Like I'm just pain, okay? You are probably playing this out with your spouse cross pollinating, which means maybe in money, one of you is a narcissist and maybe in time, one of you is a narcissist and maybe in the bedroom, one of you is a narcissist and then, you know, in the friendship, one of you is a narcissist and you got to figure that out. All you have to do is balance your relationship, not theirs. If you balance your relationship with yourself, they have to change. But see, an empath who's with a narcissist is so obsessed by the scraps that they are given that they hold on for the next taste, all right? And the narcissist is sucking the energy from the empath until there's nothing left, right? So this relationship happens with money and time. It's not always another person that's playing the narcissist. I guarantee you your money feels like a narcissist right now, probably, right? Feast or famine. Oh, here's a little, here's a little something because you're a loser, right? And then you spend it and they're like, you need more already, loser. That's money. Is that is that your money? Okay. You're you're in a narcissistic relationship with money. You're playing the empath. Okay. Then there's people in your life that are playing the money narcissist who won't give it up. And they got too much of it. And you know they can't take it with them. And you know they're about to die. But they won't give it to you. That's rude. Okay, so there's all kinds of stories floating around. You got to figure out which one you're playing. That's it. It doesn't even matter which one. It doesn't matter if you're the narcissist or the empath. You can still be at the end of the bridge and be a narcissist here because it's just a perpetrated wound. It's just a wound in protection of defense. An empath is, I have no walls. Take everything I own, except the walls are basically the wall between you and you. You believe that you're here to save this planet. And really what you're supposed to do is heal thyself and let the overflow of that healing energy seep into the collective and change the game. Changes the formula, guys. If I put dirt into my clean water, it's dirty. And if I clean out my cup, it's clean. So when you, a being that is connected to every other being in the universe, goes clean, you put that clean water into this dirty collective. When you are dirty and starving and hungry and you're saving other people, what happens? Are they saved for very long or do they need you next week? Do they need more cash next week? Do they need more of your time next week? And you're going, there's a pattern here, all right? And I think if you're at the end of the bridge, you've gone into the villain stage of your empathy. You're now in the villain part of your life where you are the bad guy, congratulations. All right, because if you are the villain right now, a recovering wounded empath, and you're choosing you and you've got boundaries, I'm sure people will piss off at you. Okay, your kids are like, Who are you and what have you done with our mother? And you're like, New sheriff in town, right? I love me first. You guys can get the ration of what's left, not the essence of me. You're getting my ration. Okay, and they're going, whatever. She doesn't love us. And now they're creating their own wound to deal out with therapy when they're in their forties. God bless them. Okay. Because we are actually loving them properly now by saying, I figured out how to fill up my own cup and give you the ration of what's left. Now your job is to fill up your own cup and share the rest with the world through art, through magic, through science, through word, through dance, through harmony, through coaching, whatever. doesn't even matter. Because the more your cup gets full, the more it's going to come out. You cannot hold it back. This isn't a job I really want to do. I can't not not do it because I need a place to vomit every three days. Okay? Because my cup is overflowing. Same as you. But see, what happens is when you create all these dams around you, your message, your art, your song, your presence, your inventions, then they die inside of you and you're going, well, why did they get to do it? Okay, that's when the, the narcissist becomes the self. When you do not let your greatness out, you are trapping yourself. Why? You really give a shit what anybody thinks? If I, a mind reader, told you how little they think of you, 
They think of you so little, you would just be out there dancing naked because they really aren't looking at you. If they do see you, they are so self-absorbed in their pain that the only thing they see about you is what they feel about them in comparison to you. They don't see you. Here you are going, I'm not seen and heard. Okay, let's do your podcast. Oh no, I don't want people to see and hear me. I'm like, wait, you want your money back is I'm not gonna coach you. You know, like, do you hear that? Do you hear, I hear that almost every week? Every week, I'm like, oh my gosh. So what I'm doing is calling your bluff now because my own bluff got called. My own bluff got called too. I'm like, I'm gonna create this biohacking program. This is gonna be freaking easy. It wasn't, it was not. I almost died eight times, okay, at least. Y'all have died a hundred times since doing it. So you know what I mean? Like none of it is easy, but it's worth it because all you're gonna do for the rest of your life is starve and feed, starve and feed starve and feed okay that is just existing in survival your entire life is survival now the animal community loves this reality and they can be quite creative with it that's what they came here to do this isn't a game of narcissist empath with the squirrels okay now they get too close to humans they might start acting like that because our our water starts to get into their collective and they start behaving as nuts as we are, dumb domesticated animals that live within people get cancer and they are narcissists. They will steal other food. Then you see out in the wild, these stories of like, you know, a tiger saving a deer. You're like, oh, that wouldn't happen in my neighborhood. Hell no. You know, that deer would be like food. You know, but you think about in nature where rhythm is in harmony. And if that tiger isn't hungry and it just lots its baby tiger and there's a fawn walking around, guess what's going to happen when that tiger's not hungry? Love. Because when there's not hunger, there's love. So when you get into a relationship that is based on hunger, there won't feel like love. Does this resonate? Okay. So. I want you guys to take stock of this because my second Sunday was all about where can you balance now, right? In your now reality, in your job, in your relationship. Notice how I'm not like, pack your shit and go, quit your job, leave your husband. Like, I've never said that, although I've wanted to. I have never said that, okay? But now we're at this place where, okay, I'm going to build my new reality in my old reality. And the way that I align with my buried treasure is to get satisfied, all right? Doesn't mean that you don't want more. It doesn't mean, but I bet you that if you looked around every single thing you have in your life, it's settled version of what you really want, a settled version. Now, if there are things that you were like, nope, that's my dream car, okay? Nope, this is my dream house. For a caterpillar you don't know what a butterfly would want you don't know right so I, I thought about it i was like is this my dream house for for um butterfly and then i thought well i really love the beach and then you know what my butt my caterpillar said salt and sand like it just ruins everything you're gonna have to buy a new dishwasher every year and i was like "Ooh, i don't know if i want to live on the beach again because i've done that and i have to buy a new dishwasher every year because that damn salt and I'm like, you see how it's like problems. And then I thought, wait, if I'm a butterfly, I just go stay there sometimes, right? Maybe I just do a timeshare. Maybe we just all buy a house in some co country and switch. You, we all live in a month, right? I'm down. I got enough of you. You're 4,000 4, miles away, right? You're 800, no, 1,800 miles away, maybe. You know, so we can do that. Let's just all buy a house so that we never have to live in the same house and then we can practice non-attachment. You know, we just put all the mortgages in one pot and then divide it based on, you know, I guess location or whatever. You know what I mean? It's just like, who knows what we're going to be when we're butterflies? But none of these rules that we live by right now, this is why when you start to dream, you cut yourself off because you dream to a certain place, but then you factor in responsibility, time, money, management and then you go I don't know if I want that 
but you're also playing factoring in caterpillar rules okay butterflies don't have rules they make it up as they go this is why you, when you find your inner child again and you start playing in the clay and you mold things and you you blend dark and light and you make stuff with it it's like all of a sudden you're like i didn't need rules i just needed to play with both of these things so take your darkest part and your lightest part bring it together and find a balance in your time find your biggest money challenge okay and find the greatest thing that money has bought you right now and analyze both of the vibrations. It'll neutralize. Remember, positive, negative, neutrality. When you are in neutral zero point energy field, the universe thinks you are complete. So it goes, oh, give her everything in the escrow quick. Now, when you're going, ah, oh, I just manifested in manifestation of meditation for two hours. I feel enlightened. Let that high go through all of your serotonin and the dopamine starts to run out and you start to notice you don't have your stuff. Now you're human again. Now you're a caterpillar again. Now you're going, what's the point of dreaming? Because I just spent two hours in meditation and I opened up my pineal gland and I, you know, rooted it in my kundalini and I, you know, had an orgasm. And now I'm just a caterpillar again because I just got a fat bill in the mail for the exact money that I wanted to manifest to buy my new car. What's the point of this? Okay, so that's not balance. That's not balance. Balance is clearing out the shit and clutter of your life. Balance is finding the happy mediums in your relationship. You know, stop fantasizing about running away from home constantly and figure out what the trauma is that's causing that. Speak more to your darkness. Speak more to what your darkness is actually starving for and find a methadone, okay? Because the methadone is going to be the slightly, slightly worse addictive measurement, okay? Because when you take a child, you know what an addiction is? The definition of an addiction when I channel the inner child? It's a security blanket. That's it. All addiction is a security blanket. And that's really sad. So when we look at our addicts of our family and we're like, you're disgusting, that's their blanket, you guys. And if they had, trust me, when they are satisfied or coming down, they don't want to feel like that. When they get starving, they will steal all of your money. Okay. They will tell you anything that you want to hear. But when they are not in that state of need, they don't want to be addicted to that. I used to remember my daughter, she'd come to me and she'd go, mom. In two weeks, I want you to take this blanket away. And it's getting embarrassing, you know? And I'm like, well, okay, well, when you're ready. And then two weeks would come and she'd sit down and go, maybe in two more weeks. I'm like, okay. And so I thought about that and it started to get raggedy and raggedy. And of course we'd have to wash it because I mean, she'd just, you know, drool all over it. I mean, she was a toddler. Uh, she was like four and it was starting to shrink. And I was like, we got, this thing is going to disintegrate. And of course, you can find the exact same blanket. Uh-uh. No. This is why, like, you can't find another person when you have an addictive addiction to a person. You cannot replace them. All right? And so finally, one day, it was basically, like, becoming shreds. And I had bought replicas. I even tried to trash it up a bit. She could smell that it wasn't her blanket. This kid. And so finally, one day, I thought, what do you want more than this blanket, right? What do you want more than this blanket? And she was like, I just want to tie my shoes. And I was like, okay. I said, so let's tie your shoes. She was, well, when I tie my shoes, do you think I'm going to want this blanket? And I go, it doesn't matter. You can keep the blanket. So we learned how to tie the shoes. And I don't know why that was a big deal for her, but it was, she's the middle child. So I got to do it myself, you know? Because the older sister trying to do everything for her. I'm trying to do everything for her, you know. And she tied her shoes. And then it ended up in the dryer one day. And we still don't know what happened to it. Because we don't know if it disintegrated or it quantum leaped. It time traveled. We don't know. But it never came out. And to this day, she thinks I threw it out. To this day, I think she needs therapy over it. But she wasn't actually that upset. She was like, and I said, what if it went to another little girl? that needed it more than you. And she was like, okay. I don't know if I want to believe that, but I'll, I'll take that one, you know? And so when we look at your addictions, a lot of times you can't get rid of them because you're in such resistance of it. You are so 
so oblivious to it. It's like, face it. Okay, I'm addicted to this, damn it. Okay, and it's your security blanket. Be kind to yourself, all right? So I want you, as we wrap up today's class, I want you to look at this idea of August energy as it's time to balance this year, all right? This year has smacked you silly, all right? Your freedom opened up, but then some of your freedom was now asking you to grow as a person and a, a lot of your bluff got called here, okay? A lot of you put yourself in very accelerated, uncomfortable positions to grow, congratulations. Now you're going to deal with the aftermath of growth, right? Which is to be new. That's a whole new fun world that's going to open up for you. Some of you have really like got inside of yourselves, right? Made yourselves a priority. A lot of you have let things go. So wherever you are now in the August energy, we've had the Aquarius full moon. that's like really giving you a gut check on where you are, where you are. Big picture here. Lionsgate. Hey, call your bluff. Hey, powerful manifestator, you guys, are you powerful or are you just prideful? Like that's what Lionsgate called you out where you were. So now August, we're wrapping it up. We're moving along. September energy, okay? It's time for new. Even though we're moving into fall in this part of the world, things are falling away. Then in other places, spring and summer are coming. So again, it doesn't really matter where you are, you're starting new. So where do you want to start new is in a balance point because if a plant has too much water or too much not water, it's going to die. So look at everything like a plant's needs, not over excessive and not starvation. Do not deprive yourselves of food. Do not deprive yourselves of self-care or orgasms or whatever you need, okay? Do not provide, d d deprive yourself. But on the flip side, see where your addictions, talk to your inner child. What could be better that you could work for? Okay. And say, I'm not going to take this away until we get this. And then it's like, okay, give me the knife in your hand and I'm going to give you this awesome ball. Right. Because addiction is also monitored by the level of pain you've carried, your level of starvation. So if you're starving for energy, you're going to be addicted to something that gives you energy, okay? If you're starving for substance, starving for substance, you're going to be addicted to something that gives you substance. If you're starving for love, nothing more bloated, full of bullshit love than a narcissist, right? All they are is, is too much love that they did not want, okay? And they're going to punish anyone around them. So wherever you are starving is where you are. And it's beautiful because it is your classroom. Your classroom. Your starving is your classroom. Okay. What is happening to you? What is happening around you? What is happening through you? What you are witnessing and how it affects you is all you. It's reflection and projection. Projection is who you channel out of you. Whoa, that was my mother. That was my father. And what you see back is either pot is either a reflection of your highest highest self your lowest lower self or someone in between oh the amazon truck yay <laughs> i wonder what day it is we don't know <laughs> anyways i'm going to wrap up the class now and this is about balancing your state of being remember the universe is not catering to what you're doing it's catering to what you're being that's why you got to check in and go who am i being right now who am i being at work who am I being in my relationship? Who am I being with time? Who am I being with money? Who am I being with other people? Who am I being? Who is my ego being? Who's my inner child being? Who's my higher self being? You're going to have to do a check-in and then times it three. And then go, well, my ego really wants to tell this person to shut up. But my inner child's curious. Good. Explore it. Explore it. Because if you don't know what your state of being is, you will not understand your guru called reality. Your reality is the biofeedback. It is the level of vibration that you are emitting 24 seven. You don't turn this off, all right? And it is feeding back to you in a time gap, which means what is happening right now is who you were being before. This is why echoes are freaking annoying because who I was being before is now showing up when I'm not being that. You see, now I'm being a happy, loving person and this echo of a sick person is showing up 
Well, guess what? Now you get to practice your new state of being with a sick person. Now you get to practice your new state of being with something breaking, with someone abandoning you. You get to practice this new state of being as this butterfly with a caterpillar in your face. You get to practice. And the universe is like, I'm going to give you three practices before I try to take you back to the starting point where you have to be a caterpillar again. Three choices, three chances, three major echoes, which means when you get into the new state of being, you're going to be faced by the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future in the form of something breaking, losing something, getting sick, getting attacked or judged. It's, it's just math. You guys shouldn't even be shocked at this point when it happens. You should be laughing like, oh, here's this one again. I had someone reach out this morning and go, what's the fourth echo? And I've got, she listed the brain and I go, sick. She goes, I'm sick. And I'm like, okay. And we laughed, you know? I mean, what are you going to do? It's just, it's just how do you exit the matrix? It's how to get out of the matrix. It's a process. It's like double dutch. It's like, okay, we've got to get over here and we've got to stay in our balance. Why these ropes are going like this. I will tell you, enlightenment is like playing double dutch. You got to stay in your focus of jumping up and down like this when two ropes are literally going like this and people are saying things to you. So let's play double dutch and you'll find your balance. All right. Okay, guys, I will see you in the webinar in about 15 minutes. See you later. Bye.